As the U.S. Supreme Court decides the future of health care reform signed by President Obama, there's more scrutiny for its predecessor in Massachusetts. Both versions combine subsidies with mandates on individuals and businesses. Aside from legal questions about the power to mandate, there's also continuing debate about the best way to health care access and affordability. Some of that debate can be found in the book recently issued by the Pioneer Institute. Our guest is one of the book's contributors at the Institute. He's the director of health care policy. We'd like to welcome Joshua Archambault. Thank you very much for being with us, Josh. Thanks for having me, Chris. Start with uh, the case in Massachusetts. Uh, it's not as wonderful as everybody hoped it would be, but it's hardly as catastrophic as some people running for president make it sound these days. So, so where do you come in between those? <laughs> sure. So from Pioneer's perspective, we've never taken a position on the law. Really, we've wanted just to evaluate what actually has taken place during the experiment. So in the book, we have a whole chapter that looks at data of where we currently are. And what we find is it depends on who you are. If you're an individual uh, purchasing insurance, this reform has actually been pretty gr great for you. If you're a small business, the reform hasn't been as promising for you. And so we just wanted to be able to present the full case in a very convincing, concise way so folks can decide for themselves what they think. A key issue here is the connector, which uh, serves up the, the health care options, especially for small businesses. There haven't been that many options, and they haven't been all that affordable. So uh, uh, how could you make that better? Sure. So what we outline in the book also is a number of ways that implementation has impacted the reform. In many ways, folks call it Romney care. They should probably call it Patrick care after Governor Patrick, who's been largely responsible for implementing the law. And in that leeway that he was given in the reform, he's made a number of decisions in the connector. For instance, they've minimized the difference between the health plans, how many health plans can be in there. So what we'd like to see going forward is for them to open it up, to be a little bit more competitive and to allow the individuals purchasing in there more choice in what plans they actually pick. Of course, so doing that, I guess, means interstate competition. No, no, I think you could start by doing it in, internally in Massachusetts for those that are purchasing through the connector, allowing them to have a lot greater choice of the plans. Right now, they're kind of restricted in what options they can buy, and the minimum level of the coverage that is offered to them is often more generous than what was even available in the private market before the reform, so it makes it much more expensive. What's the, uh, the real drivers of that expense? Because you mentioned there are certain mandates that are put into what these plans have to contain. Uh, what kind of mandates are we talking about that, that make this so costly? So there's state mandates that are passed by the legislature, and then there's what the connector has, which is a minimum credible coverage, which goes beyond the state mandate. So we're talking everything from hair uh, implants and toupees to IVF for, you know, if you're having trouble getting pregnant to autism coverage. Again, each individual one is something that a lot of folks support, but when you add them all up, they fall disproportionately on small business and these individuals purchasing inside the connector. Because if you get your insurance from a large employer, you're actually regulated by federal law and not subject to these mandates. So we just want folks to understand that there is a cost trade-off when you pass these mandates. We've heard, too, about the technology driving costs and defensive medicine driving costs. Is that much of an issue here? Yeah, you know, I think in our state we have a variety of reasons why our health care is so expensive. First being cost of living. I mean, it simply drive, makes medical uh, care that much more expensive. We also have some market issues in our state where we have certain large medical institutions that can demand slightly higher rates for their care. So it's, it's not one issue that drives the cost up, it's many, and that's why in the book we want to address not just one, we're not saying this is the silver bullet, but we need to move in the direction in which consumers have a little bit more choice. What about some of the other ideas, at least uh, for making things better in Massachusetts? Sure. So what we advise the legislature to do and the governor is to get serious about changing the way that we interact with our health care system. So things like minute clinics. We've moved in this direction over the last few years, but we need to make the health care system that much more flexible for individuals that work and maybe can't go see a regular doctor. That's why we've seen in our state a lot of folks still go to the emergency room. We hoped once they got insurance card they wouldn't go at quite the level that they were before the reform, but that hasn't been the case. So we need to allow for greater flexibility in our health care system to accommodate what people need. Along with that go, um, is what we call scope of practice and not to get too far off into the weeds. But what do you have to see a doctor for? What can you see a nurse for or a nurse practitioner? There's certainly some cost trade-offs there when you always see a doctor for even the most routine procedures. Uh, that's interesting because one of the areas where there's been a, a lack of progress in Massachusetts is in shifting medical visits from emergency rooms to outpatient settings and in also just catching up in that shortage of primary care physicians. Uh, what can be done about those? 
So there's a, there's a couple ideas that are out there, and we're certainly working on them day to day. For one instance that we've, uh, and an example that we've thrown out that other states have looked at are a medical enterprise zone. So in essence, this is modeled off an idea of economic enterprise zones in which you select certain locations. Typically, they're in more urban settings or rural settings. And you say the state makes a commitment saying, if you would like to set up your medical institution in these communities, we're going to help you. We're going to make it a little bit easier for you to set up. We'll cut some of the red tape for you so that you can set up more quickly. This gets to some of the shortage issues that we do actually have in this state in more rural areas in particular. Looking at the bigger picture nationwide, uh... Uh, this book uh, seems to point toward, uh, instead of having a unitary approach, so Obamacare, it's maybe better to have different states do different things for a while? Sure. I mean, the way that we discuss it in the book is we look to history for the last time we did entitlement reform. That was welfare reform in the mid-90s. And how we got to some sort of national consensus is the federal government was the leader, but they encouraged state waivers. They said, we're going to hold you accountable. We're going to set what our end goals are, but we're going to give you the flexibility to move forward. I think this is even more pronounced in the healthcare world. If you compare a state like Massachusetts, which is high income, high education, level, high medical infrastructure, most of us live near the Boston area, that's a very different starting place than a place like New Mexico or Texas where maybe you have to drive an hour to see a doctor. The employers don't offer insurance at quite the same rate that we do have here in Massachusetts. And so I think one size fits all from the federal level is probably not the best approach. It may be unwise. And you're not going to get to any sort of national consensus, as we see in the Supreme Court, as they debate this federal law, until you allow that greater flexibility. A lot of states have tried setting up uh, high-risk pools, which would make, maybe take some of the pressure off the other insurance pools. But uh, so far, the results are a little inconclusive, I guess. Yeah, so this is an actual and interesting uh, d historical study. There were 35 states that had formed of high-risk pool before the federal law passed, and they had varying degrees of success, largely due to the state level of funding. Under the federal law, they set up another version of high-risk pools, and in the book we kind of examine how they set them up and why there's been some serious issues with them. Going forward in our proposals, we would like to stick with the high-risk pool concept, but we think that the state should have a little bit more responsibility in how they structure them. And this is for those folks that have pre-existing conditions. We heard so much about during the federal debate. There's two to four million of these individuals. I think everybody agrees we want them to be able to have the coverage that they need. It's not their fault that they have cancer. But that's a much smaller problem than we th was talked about during the federal debate and could cost us a few billion dollars a year instead of the trillions of dollars over 10 years that the federal law is estimated to cost. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And the Pioneer Institute, Joshua Archambault. Still to come, mentoring for the long term, we'll hear about friends of the children, but first, this message.